Hi, everybody. Today, I would like to talk to you about documentary. In particular, I would like to present you my attempt to provide a ground to my intuition that documentary is characterized by a property which I have called the authenticity effect. My investigation has started since I realized that uh, there were many mismatches between uh, uh, philosophical theories of documentary and uh, actual works, especially in the most recent production. So I decided to go back to the definition of documentary by John Grierson, uh, the father of documentary, a point of reference both for philosophers and for filmmakers, and uh, I have found out that by substituting truth with uh, authenticity, then it is possible to argue in favor of an account with satisfying discriminatory and explanatory power. My presentation is structured in two parts. In the first part, I intend to present briefly Grierson's definition and philosophical theories derived from it. In particular, the strand grounding on the indexicality of the filmic image and represented by Curry, Gregory Curry, and the one underpinned by intentionality represented by Carroll and Ponek. In the second part, I will present my proposal by following the main steps of my argument. Then I will outline a conclusion. In 1926, Grierson writes a review about Moana, a film by Robert Flaherty, produced by a Hollywood studio, and uh, he ascribes documentary value to the filmic work. In the same year, however, he uses documentary in another sense as well, namely in the sense of an emerging vital form of cinema, and defines it as a creative treatment of actuality. So, he characterizes documentary as being a truer representation of the modern world with respect to Hollywood films. Therefore, he establishes documentary as having a comparative character with respect to fiction. Grierson's definition seems to be clear, however, it is very vague. Uh, how can truth be delivered by documentary? Philosophical theories of documentary which I have examined try to shed light on the definition grounding on the comparative character of documentary. They assume it as a subcategory of non-fiction. Uh, very roughly speaking, non-fiction is a category of works, uh, both filming and literary, for example, which is considered to refer to existing objects, to invite to believe that propositional content of the work is true, while fiction is determined by the invitation to imagining, by make-believe or pretense, it depends on the theory behind. Gregory Curry assumes that truth which Grierson is talking about is truth in terms of correspondence, underpinned by uh, the mimetic principle, and he conceives documentary as a trace of reality grounding on the indexical character of the filmic image, uh, namely the relation of brute causation between the image and the depicted object. Therefore, the necessary condition for documentary is to be a trace of reality. Surveillance records are not documentary because they lack a narrative structure and the narrative structure is necessary in Carrier's definition. Uh, his conception has some problems. For example, a film about Napoleon, whom there are no filmic traces of, uh, for Curry could not be a pure documentary, an ideal documentary. Uh, it might be maybe an impure documentary, because the only thing that it's possible to do is to make a film about people speaking of Napoleon, people which are interviewed and explaining who he was and what he did. The other strand of uh, philosophical theories is underpinned by intentionality and uh, it characterizes documentary in terms of assertion. This strand owes more to speech act theories than to film studies. Uh, Noel Carroll, for example, does not endeavor to shed light on Grierson's definition. Um, his uh, strategy is to theorize a new concept, films of presumptive assertion. His purpose is practical. He wants to provide a definition for the body of work which scholars consider as documentary and, and define these words. Uh, presumptive, uh, presumptive in the sense of suppose X, as in proofs of math. It, it's a sort of transcendental approach, and, and he admits it. 
A documentary is defined in virtue of the assertive intention of the author, who invites the audience to believe, and of the audience's recognition of the intention of the author. In contrast, always in this trend, Trevor Ponek uh, provides a definition which does not require the audience's recognition. So, a documentary is as such if the author intends the work to be a documentary. So, it depends only on the author's assertive stance. Uh, theories of this strand lack discriminating power. Indeed, it is possible that a fiction film based on, 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 on a real fact satisfy high standards of accuracy and that its author invites the audience to entertain the propositional content of the work as asserted. So, considering the, the several mismatches between these philosophical theories and actual works, I have decided to go back to Grierson's definition. And uh, I have focused on three claims included in the first uh, 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 three principles, which he uh, expressed, and I tried to see the implications. The claim referring to the comparative character of documentary with respect to Hollywood films uh, hints at a clash between the amenability of the world depicted by Hollywood filmmaker and the unamendability of the actual world which the documentary filmmaker deals with. The second claim, asserting that the film is an interpretation, may imply that the automaticity of the filmic medium does not coincide with being invisible. The filmmaker, indeed, has a perspective and makes choices. So, neutrality is not the purpose of the filmmaker. The third principle, which asserts that filming real people in real places allows to have a truer representation of the real world, seems to imply that the kind of truth which Grierson is talking about refers to the original character of the depicted object which uh, ethnographers refer to as authenticity. So, it seems to refer to the authenticity of the object, not to the true representation of the object in terms of uh, a representation underpinned by the mimetic principle. Indeed, in my view, it is very relevant for understanding the nature of the documentary that Grierson takes Flaherty as an example. Indeed, his filmmaking consists in a visual ethnographic style. In fact, Flaherty's first film, Nanook of the North, which uh, dates back uh, uh, to 1922, is considered as the first documentary ever, and at the same time, it is considered as the first ethnographic film ever. So, one might conceive documentary as a filmic form emerging from filmmaking and ethnography, but this is not the focus of this presentation. The point is that Grierson considers Flaherty as an iconic documentary filmmaker and that Flaherty adopts the ethnographic methodology of being immersed in reality for making films. What does it mean, ethnography? Ethnography, roughly speaking, may be considered as a methodological approach in, in uh, anthropology, which allows to investigate a culture, setting, group by observing it directly, immersing oneself in that environment. Uh, ethnography searches for authenticity, whose concept encompasses diverse sets of meaning that range from genuineness and originality to accuracy and truthfulness. So, authenticity is concerned with the identity of individuals and population, the authorship of products. Authenticity is a property which is bestowed to who or what is who or what claims to be. My proposal is that this immersion in reality does not only ensure a more accurate representation, indeed nobody could prevent a fiction filmmaker to do the same, rather I believe that the immersion in reality which Grierson refers to bestows to documentary the role of embodying the experiential dimension of the relation between the filmmaker and the actual in filmic works. So, watching documentary films, the viewer recognizes that the word depicted is authentic because it is represented in a way which corresponds to the perceptual experience of object seeing that we have in ordinary life, namely a complex experience in which the independence of the object merges with uh, its connectedness to the observer. 
the viewer identifies with the view of the filmmaker and has an impression that what they see is true, genuine, authentic. The point is that documentary is not truer in the sense that it is more resemblant to the actual world, thanks to the transparent medium, uh, which is the camera, or that it conveys more truth, but that it captures the authenticity of the being in the actual. And I think that my conception seems to work well with uh, Stacey Friend's theory about truth in fiction, but, but also with some theories in, in philosophy of perception. Regarding Stacey Friend, well, when we read a fiction story, we imagine that P, and by imagining that P, we imagine a whole world. This is what psychologists call a situation model or mental model, a mental micro world of what the story is about. The depicted world is never complete, so we have to make inferences to fill the gaps and develop a coherent mental representation of individuals and events involved in the story. In order to do so, usually automatically and subconsciously, we draw conclusions from the explicit test using prior knowledge. And this holds both for fiction and non-fiction stories. Mary Lord Ryan explains the use of prior knowledge by means of the principle of minimal departure, namely that story words remain as close as possible to the actual world. Walton, Lewis and, and Ryan, they interpret this principle referring to it as the reality principle, namely that one may draw a conclusion Q if a series of primary story truth, P1, P2, P3, are given. Uh, the, however, this principle does not work for zombie stories, for example, or other stories which violate physical laws of the actual work. Stacey Friend argues, without rejecting this principle, that it holds if reality is assumed as given. Stacey Friend formulates the principle of reality assumption, which claims that everything which is true in the real world is storified, namely, we are invited to imagine that it obtains in the story world unless there are specific instructions to imagine otherwise. If the principle of reality assumption is the common ground for fictional and non-fictional words, uh, then it follows that either fiction and non-fiction stories are about the real world and can convey truth. Therefore, the demarcation line between fiction and non-fiction does not depend merely on imagination and belief. It does not depend on truth. Okay, why authenticity is a better candidate to mark the character of documentary? In my view, because it is something that fiction cannot deliver. Therefore, it has more discriminating power than truth. Philosophy of perception helps us to understand in what sense Husserl, for example, conceives real objects as transcendent to human mind. In perception, we experience them always only partially and in relation with the perspective assumed. So if we change perspective, the object is always the same, but the way how it appears is different. In other words, in perception, we experience the independency of objects, their uniqueness and their transcendence, which means that actuality is unamendable by our thought. What does it mean, unamendable? For example, I might know or, or not that water is uh, referred to as uh, H2O. However, if I dive into water, I get wet. And by thinking that hydrogen and oxygen as such are not wet does not help me not to get wet. In other words, I cannot amend what is in front of me in experience by using my conceptual schemes or mere thought. Regarding perception and uh, uh, the object seeing experience, John Sir proposes that the visual experience has the form uh, there is a red fish at L and the fact that there is a red fish at L is causing this experience. Therefore, it focuses on the causal dependence of the experience on the things seen. Similarly to Kari, who reduces the, the filmic image to its existential bond with the denoted object. Serves so account, however, has some problems because it does not account for hallucination. For example, if one stands up too quickly and has the impression to see stars, you know, those little uh, black and white uh, uh, dots. Serves so description for visual experience does not distinguish between seeing stars as a mere visual sensation or the experience of object seeing. Okay, in hallucination, perceptual contact is missing, albeit according to the first person perspective, it does not seem that way.
I really think I see stars. However, they are not there. In contrast, Susan Siegel conceives the perceptual experience of object seeing as having the complex form which combines the independence of the object from the subject and its connectedness with the perceptual apparatus of the subject. So the experience of object seeing merges independency of the, of the object and connectedness uh, of the object to the subject. Uh, however, representations and content of perception have in common that there is more than the denotative level. According to Pierce, uh, for example, a sign, even a visual sign, has three orders of signification. The lower is indexicality, poor denotation. As an object is in front of the camera and the camera captures it as it appears in virtue, in virtue of the transparency of the camera. Then there is the icon, underpinned by resemblance. And then the symbol, related to the object by convention. When the viewer watches a film, all these orders contribute to the meaning of the work. Nelson Goodman puts it in, in different words. He claims that in ordinary language we use representation in a very ambiguous way. Uh, the representation of something is different from the representation of something as. The representation of refers to the level of denotation, but the representation of the object as refers to how the object appears. For example, the picture of the horse in the distance may present the horse as having the shape of a big black dot. In this case, the representation of the object denoted resembles a black dot and not a horse, as commonly represented. Uh, Walton asserts that the pictorial experience does not consist in something analogous to looking at an object through a glass, but in looking at the photograph and imagining that we see a certain object. So, in the experience of watching a film, how things are depicted contributes to appreciate the work as a fiction or as a documentary film. The spectator recognizes the experience of the filmmaker captured in the film as authentic in virtue of their own existential experience with actuality and appreciates the work as documentary. However, authenticity of the work does not emerge as a genuine property, but as an effect. In literary works, Barth asserts that realism is achieved by means of a certain style of writing which abounds with descriptions of objects, for example. These objects have the function to signify the real of the story, to provide an effect of concrete reality. It is not a matter of denotation, but of connotation. What realism authenticates, it's not the object, but the category of the real, and what is produced is an illusion. Similarly, in documentary works, the way how the camera depicts reality allows that the viewer perceives the camera as a real witness, which asserts, we are here, or what was here. The authenticity effect emerges from the perceptual uh, features of the work. However, in contrast with Carey, for example, I endorse the view according to which uh, the content of perception might be also conceptual and not only non-conceptual. Maybe this might account for the different response of different audiences. Uh, I think that this property is an accessory property but I also, I also think that together, conjointly with other properties, such as institutional properties, or which have a, 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 an important role in my, in my account, and uh, properties which have to do with the context of origin, the reputation of the author, uh, their intention, and so on and so forth, uh, um, it might be also a sufficient property. But, but I have to investigate further. <laughs> I really want to thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward for your feedbacks. What I've presented to you is uh, the outline of my MA thesis, which is uh, still a work in progress. So everything which doesn't kill it will make it stronger. So please go ahead. <laughs> All criticism is really welcome. Thank you very much. Bye bye.